Environment Center at the Pace Law School in White Plains, New York. Uh, interesting fact about Carl, he is probably one of the only commissioners in the U.S. Uh, to use and quote Winnie the Pooh uh, in one of his dissents. And again, you can read Carl's uh, bio. He's been very active in uh, uh, as a as a witness in uh, cases across the U.S. in front of commissions. So the ground rules for today's uh, debate. We will start with Carl opening, and he will have seven minutes to make his case. Travis will then have three minutes of, of cross, and then Travis will have his opening of seven minutes. And then Carl will have three minutes to cross Travis. Finally, we will have Carl's rebuttal, which will be seven minutes long, and then Travis's seven minutes long, and at that point, uh, we will take questions from the audience. So along the way, if there are questions that do come up, uh, please either jot them down or keep them, keep them in your mind, uh, and we will, when we get to that point, we will ask for questions. So first, let's see the results of the poll for the pre-debate, and the results are resolved, FERPA is still good and necessary policy in the Western electricity sector. Yes, we're 29%, and the no was 71%. So Carl, it looks like you have a little work to do to sway some of the folks in this afternoon. So, with that, you may begin your seven minutes opening. All right, thank you. Thanks for doing this. It's an important discussion, regardless of the format, and um, in spite of the limitations that one of these debaters is bringing to this conversation. Let me start by saying, let me say that there are some people who believe that monopoly control of the electricity sector is the proper goal of public regulators, legislators, and administrators. And there are some people that believe that monopoly control of the electricity sector is the desired and most economically efficient condition for that sector, despite decades of evidence to the contrary. With these people, and Travis, I hope you're not one of them, I can have no debate. Because those people have positions based on belief that is contrary to fact, to reason, and to experience. Rather than exhaust all sides with a debate premised on those beliefs, I'm gonna proceed from a different foundation. The United States is the greatest, most successful free market democracy the world has ever known. And in many places in this great country, and for more than 100 years, perhaps the largest and most capital-intense industry, the electric utility industry, still operates as a monopoly, supported in the extraction of rents and the resulting imposition of prices and costs that are too high, uneconomically high. This monopoly model was arguably justified when Samuel Insel delivered his amazing anti-competitive speech in 1898. But at least, in, at least since the 1960s, we have seen that the benefits to be extracted from that model in generation and in other ways have been exhausted. Indeed, we have learned currently low gas prices notwithstanding that the costs are now exceeding, are now exceeding any remaining benefit. Monopoly electric generation facilities cost more regardless of the fuel they run on. They cost more when they're built, they cost more when they operate, and when the undepreciated balance of their initial cost becomes uncompetitive and must be securitized or otherwise forced onto customers in a, in a desperate act to preserve financial integrity. For more than 40 years, this great nation and many of its great states have been striving to fix that condition by introducing competition into the electric industry. There have been successes in this most patriotic of undertakings, but the foundation of my argument is that the work is not yet done. Markets and competition could make electricity more affordable and less costly to our pockets, our communities, our planet, and could displace inefficient monopoly businesses models and their consequences if we let them. So not only could we do 
better, but it is a further foundation of my argument that we must do better. For today, we face grave consequences, a direct result of our failure to realize the dream of market competition and the advancement of clean, renewable energy in the electric sector a dream we codified 40 years ago. We are less innovative and competitive than we could be. We pay more for electricity service than we might. We are doing severe and unnecessary damage to our health, our climate, and to future generations as a result. Many of the gains that, gains that we've achieved over the past 40 years have been as a result of competition. Gas would not be reducing carbon emissions and lowering utility generation costs if we had not committed to competition in that industry and in organized wholesale markets. More gains are available, but we must pursue them. Simply stated, the electricity industry must always be open to newer, cleaner, and less expensive sources of generation. In the canon of national law, we have only one statute, one national statute that requires competition in the electricity sector, that is PERPA. We have only one statute that provides for meaningful defense against the rapacious prime directive of monopoly utilities to spend more than is necessary on generation, that is PERPA. We have only one national statute that enforces, at least in its design, a market regime where superior cost and price performance is rewarded with increased market share, that is PERPA. Ever since and before the adoption of the PERPA in 1978, the monopolist that is the electric utility industry and its $100 million lobbying arm in Washington, as well as several other Beltway AM agents that we might call useful assets, have been fighting to weaken the opportunity for competition and to strengthen monopolistic control. They fight to secure the unearned advantages of monopolies. Now we are asked again to weaken a law that has not been allowed to fully achieve its intended result. And it has still not been fully and fairly implemented in all the states. We are asked to weaken PERPA and the means of providing competitive generators, generators with non-discriminatory opportunities to compete. We are asked to believe that not very competitive solicitations and rebuttable presumptions should take the place of real competition. We are asked whether utilities should enjoy freedom from purpose requirements and instead be granted the regulatory license to protect uneconomic generation or to exercise market power in the renewable electricity field. We are asked to accept the false hope in a time when we need correct, concrete, and proven results. To all these, I say no. I answer the question in the affirmative because I believe we have work to do in dislodging the uneconomic monopoly preferences and consequences that remain in our nation. I say FERPA is still good and necessary policy in the Western electricity sector and in our entire nation. Thank you, Carl. I appreciate the opportunity to be here and to ask you a couple of questions today about your position. And first, let me try to proceed from the perspective of what really is valuable uh, to you about FERPA. And I hear you talking particularly about competition. Now, certain technologies do not qualify as qualifying facilities under FERPA, but Wyoming, in its past legislative session, adopted a law that will allow independently and merchant-owned coal to be paid at avoided costs forecast by the Wyoming Public Service Commission. Uh, is this in the vein of competition a law that you support? It is not in the vein, it is not in the language of FERPA, therefore no, in the terms of general competition, a fair opportunity for even that to compete would be okay. Okay, but you, so, if, if we were not debating FERPA as it stands today, you would favor, for example, amending FERPA to reflect uh, the competitive possibilities of all technologies, not just the narrow set of resources that qualify as QMs. My free market beliefs take me there. <laughs> Excellent. Um, what, in your view, is the least economically efficient renewable energy policy in the United States today? The least economically efficient? Yeah, if you, had, if you were asked to eliminate one renewable energy policy from the corpus of laws as they exist today in the United States, what would that be? Uh, I'm, I'm struggling. I, I don't. Which of my children? <laughs> <laughs> You've got to play Abraham here and hope he 
even a greater power of economic efficiency, Carl. Yeah, yeah, I know, the epistemological defense, right? But it really sucked for the RAM. Okay, well, um, let, let, let me permit you to consider that as you, as you prepare your rebuttal remarks. Let me ask you one more question. Um, regulators administering a PURPA are often called upon to uh, forecast long-term prices to create fixed price QF contracts that have 15 or 20 year terms. Um, based on what you know today and even from this morning, uh, what's the right price to pay a 15 year renewal contract right now? Uh, it depends on where you are, depends on the market conditions, but buried within that is the assumption that that kind of decision is only made when setting administrative, administrative setting, administratively setting PERPA administrative costs. And if you sit on any decision on a CCM, put a utility in rates, you are making a bet that is at least as long. PERPA contracts, where they're appropriately generous at like the 15 to 25 year range, are not even as long as the 40 years that commissioners regularly obligate taxpayers to assume under traditional cost of service regulation. So um, it's, you, you, we make our best efforts, we, make a, we, make, we set it in a regulatory proceeding, we don't permanently live with those consequences, however, or shouldn't, because everything should remain contestable. Thank you, Carl. Um, let me proceed on my remarks today by first agreeing with Carl that uh, if I were merely here to propagate the idea that a monopoly is the only way to go about the procurement of electric power generation, uh, there might not be much of a debate to be had. Uh, but that's not where I am in this conversation, and it's not where I would lead all of you in good faith to. I'm forced to deny the resolution and take the negative position today uh, because I don't think PERPA has remained good public policy in light of all else that has happened in the electric power sector since 1978. And to give you an example of the type of competition that PERPA leads to, uh, let, me, let me prepare for you an analogy. Imagine that you're ready to buy a new vehicle. Uh, you conduct some online research and then you prepare yourself to walk into a dealership where you expect to see a sticker price and look down from there, realizing always that you can go to another source uh, for your car purchasing purposes uh, if the request, if the salesman seems sketchy, if the price remains too high, if the quality of the product is not so good. When you arrive there, the salesman sits you down and shows you a government agency's long-term price forecast of all the various components that go into electric power plants the cost of labor, the cost of aluminum, the cost of textiles, the cost of lithium, uh, interest rate forecasts, and he blends all of these together using a proprietary model, an Excel spreadsheet, or something even more complicated, properly weights them, and it spits out a price uh, that represents the avoided cost of a vehicle purchase, and that is the price you must pay for your, pe for your vehicle, and the salesman says with a smile, not a penny more. It's a great deal compared to the incumbent down the road. That's the type of competition that has resulted from PERPA. Not one that revolves around the price discovery that you have in a competitive market, but one that actually extracts the very infirmities that Carl criticizes about regulated monopolies, and then proceeds to double down on them, proceeding from the premise that every schoolyard child knows is wrong, that two wrongs don't make a right, except in PERPA they do. And that's the problem with PERPA, is that despite the gloss competition that sometimes accompanies its proponents' rhetoric on the subject matter, it doesn't really resemble competition as economists really understand it. Simply put, administrative pricing uh, on which most purple contracts in the United States are formed is flawed. Uh, they ignore that there is a competitive market opportunity to set avoided cost pricing by putting power generators in competition with one another, both incumbent monopolies competing against uh, independently owned projects as well as independently owned projects competing against themselves. Igno it ignores the fact it lives in a time when the monopoly did have uh, a supply monopoly politically, legally, de jure de facto on all consumers. Whereas even in the vertically integrated Western United States, you now see, see a blossoming of retail side competition through direct access programs, utility buy-throughs, and other programs that have given corporate purchasers the ability to access renewable technology directly. Third, you've seen declining renewable energy costs, costs that have persuaded most utilities to acquire the vast amount of renewables that are 
today interconnected in the Western interconnection, not through PERPA, mandatory purchase obligations, but instead through the IRP and through competitive solicitation processes coming out of it. Fourth and finally, I, I don't understand why as a public policy we would continue to have to have PERPA if on the books in a, in a number of states in the West that today constitute a majority of customer load in the United States, you have 100% clean energy purchase obligations by date certain. Um, doing that and PERPA seems to be duplicative and second best. Um, I just want to walk through, perhaps, to give a few examples of the practical problems that have gone wrong with PERPA lately, a few examples from other states. And we can begin with Colorado, which I think has tried to implement PERPA fairly and is second to none in the Western interconnection in terms of its openness to the competitive supply of energy. Colorado uh, has long tried to comply with PERPA uh, through uh, practice and now a more formal rulemaking docket 19R-0096E that allows avoided costs to be determined by competitive solicitation. In other words, QFs can participate in competitive solicitations, and if they win, they have a legally enforceable obligation under PERPA to sell their output to uh, the utility. Uh, to satisfy the bidder in the competitive solicitation, and this is a competitive solicitation, by the way, uh, a bulk of which is cordoned off from the mere, the, even the participation of the incumbent utility, uh, it is overseen by an independent administrator, but a jilted bidder, a QF, uh, who did not receive a contract under that process, uh, then went to federal court and arguing PERPA uh, said that it should receive prices not based on the outcome of the competitive solicitation, in other words, what renewable facilities actually said they would be willing to be paid for their construction, but instead based on a two-year-old avoided cost forecast used under the Colorado Commission's methodology. They prosecuted this in court until the Colorado Commission said we'll take another look at under the hood of this rule of ours. The Colorado Commission seems in their great credit to be doubling down on the use of competitive solicitations, but that unfortunately will simply lead everyone back to federal court where a federal judge will have to decide whether or not PERPA stands for the proposition that administrative price forecasts seem to take precedence over competitive solicitations. Because FERC has remained silent on this particular issue, or has even given comfort to those who say they need to be based on administrative price forecasts and not competitive solicitations, it stands a relatively good chance that in federal court, a federal judge will find that those projects need to be paid based on stale market price forecasts. My own home state, Montana, uh, has seen a lot of QF development. A lot of these are paper contracts where development capital is spent not really on developing sites, doing earth movement, seeking interconnections candidly, but rather have development costs tied up in litigating and getting the right price announced by the regulatory commission, at which point they flip their contracts to someone who can actually develop the project. In other words, what we're seeing in states like that and across the West are not developers who actually intend to develop projects, but developers who are simply engaging in the very type of rent seeking that both Carl and I would probably lament in other contexts of the electricity sector. And these are not people just trying to develop uh, run of the river or run of the irrigation ditch type projects. One of the biggest developers in Montana active today uh, is a little company called Con Ed, uh, one of the biggest renewable purpose developers uh, in the Western United States today. Uh, its development affiliate has decided that uh, it will play in the Western interconnection. Um, is Mr. Wade for the Con Ed? Thank you. So my, basically to close, how expensive do we want to make decarbonization? We can't just have a situation where we say renewables are ipso facto good, they're all, all our children, and so we can't uh, cast off any of the bad eggs. Mr. Bob, three minutes for thoughts. Okay. Um, I have a long list of general questions. Please start with some very specific ones. First, a comment. Um, in response to your question of which of the renewables, any renewable energy standard that allows for the direct combustion of dirty municipal waste renewable electricity uh, because of the terrible record of environmental injustice associated with those facilities would um, deserve a hard look from me. So um, I, I guess the first question I'd ask you, Travis, is, is it better to pay less or pay more? Pay less. Good. All right. On that, we agree. Um, in terms of competing against each other and using Colorado as the example, is that the standard in all the Western states, their process for solicitations? Not all, but I'm having to say a growing number. So, 
Um, Colin, when does Excel actually initiate its competitive solicitation? As I understand it, after uh, the integrated resource planning process is finished. And what's the schedule for that? I believe every two or three years. Two or three years. Okay. So that two, so you get a two-year-old uh, process after it's decided, and then you have to wait two or three more years, just as with your two-year-old of what you promised. You can include the IRP uh, after the commission issues its findings on it. The IRP withstands some further revision, and then a solicitation is issued. And is that, IR, is that IRP standard that the commission reviews, is that the same uh, standard for IRPs that's practiced in the rest of the Western states? Most, most IRPs happen, yes, on a biennial or triennial cycle. And, and, and not only the schedule, but also the standard. Are they submitted for commission approval, and are they not accepted unless specifically approved by the commission? Are they congested proceedings? There are, there, there are different standards for all of them. Some of them have a more trial-like to them and others are just sort of file and use, yes. All right, and then so as long as we're going with, with that standard, can the utility compete again in Colorado? Uh, for a, a particular, for no more than 50% of the incremental. 50%? Yes, they are cordoned off from competing with uh, the half of the incremental needs, and in practice, I believe the utility has only served about 20 to 25% of the incremental needs. The rest are independent developers. Okay. All right, so what we're talking about there is not exactly free market competition, is it? No, all of, all of this regulation is imperfect competition, I agree with you. So in, in that, we're kind of heading down the same territory. If we could get to it, uh, how much time do I have? We have 20 seconds. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, if we could get to it, I've got a whole bunch more questions, so let's stop there. <laughs> all right, Mr. Bonnie, you have seven minutes for your rebuttal. All right, so I'm kind of re re revisiting this situation. I think because we're having, once again, one of these periodic debates about FERPA, and we've had them periodically, and we've addressed them in Congress through democratic processes, and we've addressed them in commission hearing rooms. I got to vote on Texas's implementation of avoided cost rates, the first ones, when I joined the commission back in 1983. It took that long because of the fights that went all the way to the Supreme Court. Um, but it's appropriate to ask us, what has happened to make this debate timely? Um, what makes this debate appropriate? Why exactly do we need to talk about fundamental changes to weaken FERPA and the opportunity for competition in the generation sector in the United States and the electricity industry? Are utilities no longer the high cost generation builders among their peers in the industry? They still are. Are they no longer motivated by the average Johnson effect, especially in vertically integrated um, regulatory regimes and the rate making formula to seek to overbill and to overspend? They still are. Have utilities stopped socializing the costs of volatile fuel prices? They still do. Do utilities no longer enjoy hope and blue field protections for their investments that competitive generators do not? They still do. Have utilities entered the renewable energy field with lower overall costs than their competitive provider, than competitive providers? Not yet. Have competitive providers lost their ability to innovate and systematically undercut utility costs? They still can. Do new resources no longer offer the benefits of lower marginal costs? They still do. Do those competitors still reply on competitive financing? and bear market risk themselves and only rely on customer counterparties when they perform as promised, they still do. Do small QFs no longer face real and discriminatory barriers to market access, even where organized markets exist? They still do. Has FERC lost its ability to revisit its implementing regulations and adopted presumptions in order to keep up with market conditions? It has not. Has anyone actually offered evidence that FERPA increases costs more than it decreases them? I have not seen. So while we're at it, can we unpack the trope that because market prices can be lower than avoided costs, FERPA costs customers money? Well, with non-discriminatory access, there's no obligation above 20 megawatts. 
So we must only be talking about prices where there are no markets by definition, where administratively determined avoided costs are the market. For small QFs, the must-buy provision based on administrative determined avoided costs is only a rebuttable presumption. Has anyone done their homework to rebut it? Let's not lose track of what FERPA was intended to do. It was intended to encourage small and clean power production. With climate change and global warming already adding trillions in cost to public and private budgets across the country and around the world, this is more than ever a critical issue. I have grandchildren, damn it. So I will concede that when all independent power QFs have true non-discrimination, and your innovative coal plants, have true non-discriminatory access and opportunity to provide lower cost energy and capacity, then we could do away with the must-buy and LEO obligations, LEO provisions, and the responsibility of regulatory commissions to administratively determine avoided cost rates and fair contract terms. Call me when that happens. Call me when we have free markets, real markets, that signal real prices, and when small generators no longer face systematic discrimination and hurdles to market participation. But this is our reality. Even after 40 years, significant amendments, and a huge body of flexible regulation that has kept up with the times, PURPA is still not only good, but necessary. I'll just reply briefly that I don't think we're really necessarily conversing about renewable energy, which, as I said in my opening, has fallen in cost to such an extent that the levelized cost of energy from new entrants in the wind and solar space may have been crossed over uh, and be less than the going forward costs of certain coal, gas, and oil plants. And where that's occurred, those plants should be moved out of the stack and retired through competitive market forces, through IRP, use whatever tool that you have available to accomplish that end to save consumers money. And the proof is, in th those situations, and Colorado is a good example, Oregon is a good example, of situations where significant amounts of renewable energy have been added to the power supply portfolio, uh, and where power plants that have not yet reached the end of their remaining useful life from a depreciation standpoint have nonetheless been shown to be uneconomic and retired. Um, it, I agree that there are certain areas of the country where public policy has lagged behind. Our resolution scopes this issue to the West, which I think has done a relatively good job, perhaps compared to certain other regions of the country that haven't, uh, that don't, do not participate in robust markets. Um, I will say there, there are nascent uh, energy price signals uh, in the Western United States that have a more conventional locational marginal price expression uh, through the energy imbalance market. They're not perfect. Um, but even besides that, there are also bilateral wholesale markets that show a lot of business, like the Palo Verde hub, like the mid sea hub, uh, out of which and into which people uh, buy and sell energy routinely in the Western United States that provide a yardstick. As to the idea that uh, PURPA costs are not shown to be larger than the alternative, I'm not going to respond to that, but I will just invite every utility regulator in the audience today to reflect on their own personal experience with PURPA in that regard. How many PURPA contracts do you know of that are below the current prevailing market price? That were below the prevailing current market price of five years ago or 10 years ago? Very, very few, if any. Ironically, one of the reasons that a company like PG&E's rates are so high is because of out-of-market PURPA obligations that are tied to them and other quasi or sub-market uh, obligations that are still connected to them uh, from the 1990s and early 2000s. Uh, ironically, they're now facing competition by people who can do renewables cheaper through community choice aggregators. Um, that, that is the legacy, unfortunately, of PURPA, is a generation of renewable stranded costs uh, that have not performed uh, to the expectations of the market. We can also just apply a simple heuristic to understand whether or not PURPA leads to good deals. As I said, you have administrative price forecasting that has tended to be the background, uh, the backbone of PURPA contract formation when regulators tend to use forecasts that shoot high 
and the result in a high fixed price contract being offered to QF developers versus forecasts that end up in a lower fixed price. Where do you see most often contracts forming given those two outcomes? Surely, where the avoided price announced as the right price by the regulator is on the higher side. And that blows out of the water this whole notion that PERPA delivers on a policy basis some kind of customer indifference. Because if you don't have projects competing against one another to engage in price discovery around what they're willing to be paid to produce megawatt hours of energy, and you're just relying on some kind of call and response regulatory regime that PERPA sets up, you're always going to bias toward the high side. And that's the experience of regulators today. It's a true shame that where competitive features have tried to be introduced into the PERPA compliance regime, states have run into problems with them. California, the state of California, that notoriously anti-renewable jurisdiction of California, set up a PERPA compliance regime that is a reverse auction that tries to drive price discovery by competing PERPA projects, and those projects were awarded prices and tranches of PERPA contracts under that reverse auction pricing mechanism. But again, a jilted PERPA bidder went to federal court, uh, which invalidated, said that the, the auction mechanism was not compliant with PERPA in a case called Wyoming Creek, and now on appeal to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, saying that a QF has an unlimited uh, right to sell its output under, uh, under PERPA. Um, and so we've got to do a reality check here. If PERPA is resulting in outcomes that are insufficiently pro-renewable, even from the vantage point of a state like California, where are we? Pretty out in left field, I would say. The, the situation cries out for a resolution or further guidance from FERC before uh, further court, court rulings are made. In Colorado, going back to that example, the Colorado Independent Energy Association is so fed up with PERPA, trying to, PERPA projects trying to circumvent competitive solicitations for renewables that they've started opposing their requests in court. Never thought I'd see the day where the IPP Association is going to court on the same side as the incumbent utility, the regulatory commission, and the consumer advocate all saying, this is madness. And yet that's what's happening. I believe that we can use the PERPA lemon, as it's become, uh, to make a bit of lemonade call. And in Congress, when it reconsidered PERPA in 2005, it wrote section 210M1, subsection C, that provides the opportunity for places outside of RTOs uh, to be considered for an exemption from the mandatory purchase obligation if they show a sufficient amount of progress toward being a comparably competitive market with RTOs. I think that's where the West should go. Uh, I invite Carl and others to help try to populate what competitive practices would be in, in a marketplace which, like MISO and like SPP, still live with vertically integrated incumbents, which you and I can agree might not be necessarily the optimal mode of procurement. But given that situation, I still think there are ways we can promote competition and not do so in a way of purpose too long to make a right to mention. All right, thank you gentlemen both very much. You've had the opportunity to present, present your case, to cross each other, present your rebuttal, and now the audience gets to cross both of you. Are there any, any members of the audience that have questions for either of our panelists? Yes, we And as we're, that's correct, as we're going through you will find these, these questions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't think any one of us are shrinking violence, so. <laughs> As we go through these questions, remember, go back to the app. Uh, hopefully, uh, those of you who were struggling uh, before got it figured out. If not, uh, shout out anyway. Uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, so we'll vote during questions, and then once we're done with questions, then we will see if either of our participants swayed any members of our audience today. So first question. Please identify yourself. Yes, I'm Ann Arthur, the e-writer with Energy. And I want to ask both of you, but especially you, Carl, that, that resolution there has two, I think, really important words in it that neither really hinted on a bit, but the question is, still a good policy in the Western electricity sector. So does that change your thinking at all about this? Is it really a good policy? in the Western region? 
And I think it is. I think it is because the Western region is the area with the fewest organized markets. While that's changing and there's been movement, uh, the fact is we don't have those organized markets. We're still working through commissions and vertically integrated utilities and all their incumbent advantages. Uh, th this is sort of one of the, the critical points that I would also make in response to, to Travis's comments. He acts as if we're evaluating utilities against some kind of um, perfect condition, a, a, a renewable entry against some kind of perfect condition that exists with the way the utilities operate today. It's like the joke about the neoclassical economist, you know, what do they do when they see a $20 bill? Nothing, because if it was a, 20, a real $20 bill, somebody would have picked it up, rather than just sort of that neoclassical <laughs> economics view that the status quo is somehow optimized already, I'm afraid we do have to take more of a realistic political economy view of things. These industries, this industry has been running with that, what the financial and economic people would call an unearned advantage for a hundred years. So it's good to push against that. It's good to push against that. And as I said, with the other problems, it's also necessary to push against that and in the West. And, and in my view, there's just a better way to do competition than PERPA. One where generators compete against one another for the business of customers, rather than having the utility go to the regulator, asking the regulator to call our price, and then saying it's competitive, when you have an IPP going to the regulator to ask them to do the same thing. The latter is a bastardization of competition. It is not competition properly understood. I take Carl's point that we do not live in a perfect world, but I do think even within this idea of a monopoly utility that has a legal franchise right to serve customers electricity, there are emergent best practices that allow for price discovery. Travis, wouldn't the first best thing to first do would be to order all the utilities to divest their generation and set up organized markets? I think, I think in Texas is probably as close of an example to success in competition right. as, as you've seen in yeah. the United States of America. And um, then good for the rest of the West, Texas? I mean, I, I think it's for, you know, the populations of those states to consider. Um, it was an interesting fight, probably not with a, uh, too much legwork done in Nevada, for example, uh, where that was put on the ballot and defeated last go around. Um, but I think if, if, I'll put it this way, I see more consumer side power and interest and IPPs challenging utilities on cost of capital and other merits, where I think the political dynamic is right now is that for the first time in a generation, uh, you're, you're having the incumbency of those utilities challenged in a real way. And that either is going to make them adapt uh, to try to make their product better, to serve customers who want clean energy uh, with low cost clean energy, or it will ultimately give way to some version of restructuring, whether it's full boat foreign team the monopoly Texas restructuring, or something short of that that just involves a lot more competitive aspects. So can we vote on that question? Does everybody like Travis's idea that That's you have to sell off your generation? Park City edition <laughs> of the debate. <laughs> then, we can, then we can have the percentages split. Uh, <laughs> Michelle gestured to Paul behind his back, which Paul was really taking that. No more purple. Second contribution. Paul can get up here. Uh, that was not the form of the question. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, we have them in the back. There's some bricks in. Hi, I'm Terry Morris with Send Analytics in uh, Boulder, Colorado, and as a defendant in PERPA. Uh, the question is, uh, as following up on Travis's point, it's very hard to find any circumstance in which a PERPA contract is in the money, in the, the ratepayer's interest at all. In the way technology is evolving quite rapidly, you're asking ratepayers to make a really big commitment in a pretty non-competitive structure for soliciting costs and on a go-forward basis to continue to Seems 
So just, just to focus on this, we've been enjoying falling costs because of gas prices, right? And so, or price, we've seen falling prices because of gas prices. Um, and we have this fear that if we sign a contract for some renewable energy today and costs continue to fall around it, we'll be stuck with that higher cost, right? Some long-term contract, is that? Or, you don't, or, or is your premise that you don't even think they can beat the avoided cost? Um, I disagree that we've been receiving declining costs as, in the whole, or seeing declining costs in the wholesale market as a result of declining gas prices. I think the supply side is widening with a lot of renewables entering the market, and that's forcing down costs. And as the percent of renewables increases, that's going to continue to force down costs until marginal cost of production is zero. Gas has been pretty low for a long time. The cost of renewable production has been declining very rapidly. So technologically, we would you know, that commitment to make uh, rate payers pay for something in a non-competitive framework with the long-term viability. Just like Robert said, it's, it's all these contracts are way out of the money, and it's pretty painful for the rate payer to bear. It seems like an inefficient economic mechanism to solicit long-term commitments. Yeah, I just don't understand how that's any different than a utility coming and saying, I'm going to propose to build a power plant, this is what I expect it to be. I want to depreciate this and recover it in rates with the, recover, with the rate of return over its useful life of 40 years on a straight line basis for rate payers while I reap the benefits of accelerated depreciation at the holding company level. Why is CCN generation at the utility more better once you've got that as an avoided cost and, and somebody comes in and says I offer you less. That's the map, that's the fundamental map I'm not getting. If I'm beating the avoided cost, absent a competitive wholesale market, then isn't that just a better bet than what the utility can offer? Maybe just a couple points and we can uh, use this tangent as an invitation to further empirical research because I, I, would, I'd die, I would be dying to know uh, how many of the existing FERPA contracts are in the money relative to alternatives versus how much of utility rate-based generation As is opposed in the money. being in the money at the time the contract was awarded. Yeah, that's correct. Right. How well have they actually performed as a matter of outcome? And hold up that mirror to both. Hold up the mirror to utility rate-based right. and to QFs, because I guarantee you both of them are losing occasionally. FERPA loses almost every single time, I would imagine, and utility rate-based Eh, it's suboptimal, but at least it occasionally proves out some modicum of value. Does it, would it prove out, would it prove out, most would it prove out its value, would, would it prove out its value, would it prove out its value relative to sort of a pure restructured market where we force merchant generators to compete against one another? Well, probably not. Neither, neither FERPA nor utility rate base would probably win that gambit. But if we're, if we're confining ourselves to a relative debate, which you are, Carl, between utility rate base and FERPA, I really do think FERPA's the bigger loser on this because of the mandatory purchase obligation and because of the requirement that regulators call out price forecasts even when the system doesn't necessarily even need the energy. So, I think the premise of the comparison here is that where a utility makes a commitment to a power plant and does not face a competitive market, they are less likely to be found later to be out of the money in a competitive market because there is no competitive market. But in the places where utilities have committed to these generating units and a competitive market has been introduced, we find that they are overwhelmingly out of the money on the coal and nuclear investments of the past. So, Yes, if you never test that utility commitment to a competitive market, you will see fewer times when it is out of the money. And I would just I would just say you can you can benchmark against whatever the wholesale prices that are emergent in the Western United States. You can compare those to the actual outcomes of utility rate base and FERPA contracts just within the West, and probably find that utility rate bases perform relatively better uh, than the FERPA contracts. But, you know, I would not right. posit that as absolutely the case, but it would be an interesting avenue of empirical research. You know, and 
I think you're sort of pointing, it, it, there is a fundamental reality of this, because right, we're trying to make predictions regardless of what we do. If we put solar on our roof, we're making a prediction that we think it's gonna pay off and that the retail rate situation is gonna be favorable and the regulatory situation as well. That when we do it with a 20 megawatt QF, we're doing it 20 megawatts at a time or 80 megawatts if you don't have an organized market. That's fundamentally different than doing it a gigawatt at a time. It's it's fundamentally for all 80 megawatts is nothing to sneeze at with some of the utilities people regulate out there. I mean, there are times in Idaho, for example, where the total amount of energy produced from QFs exceeds the load of Idaho power. Uh, so that this is not a rounding error uh, for, but for some jurisdictions in the West. I mean, it's, it's a big deal. Now, I will say, and this is maybe where we can join each other in a bear hug uh, on the stage. Um, <laughs> but, like, I, will, I, will, I will say that Carl is right. Someone's all, always making the big bet. And the question is, is it captive rate payers? Is it private capital? Who, is it rooftop solar owners? Someone's always making that big bet. And I do think, paradigmatically, that's a good way to understand regulation. And you do want to allocate risk to the people who can actually be in a position to manage it. And those people are not typically residential customers. Good, I would agree on that. We have time for one last question in the back. So thank you, Ethan Chase, for the field study and review. Um, and this goes to Travis's point of making lemonade um, for both uh, panelists. Uh, so uh, from my perspective, um, you know, everybody's got a lot of purple feelings that we're arguing on stage a lot about the data. Um, and right now, there's a proceeding before FERC to try to make a decision. Um, my perspective of the record there is that there actually isn't a lot of data there either. There's a lot of purple feelings. And so, you know, my, my question is, how do we deal with this procedurally, um, either at FERC or within the states? And what kind of data do we need to really make a strong decision about whether or not this is in the public interest? Thanks. I, I would just say, for s answering certain of these questions, um, I'm not sure how data intensive they are. Some of the questions are data intensive, but some of them are not. I mean, I believe you do have, um, have you've seen in the vertically integrated states cycles of IRPs and procurement activities that have emerged certain best practices associated with solicitation. Uh, which include uh, independent evaluation and monitors, um, certain types of limited offer sort of bid reopeners or two-stage auctions. Um, the, these are sort of emergent practices that have been put to the test in some jurisdictions already, uh, which I think FERC would be wise uh, to adopt as a possible off-ramp, uh, allowing you to make lemonade out of the purple lemon. Um, as to some of the other questions that are more data intensive, like the one we were just debating on, that almost might be more informative of Congress uh, about whether or not you, FERPA has resulted in net benefits for consumers. Um, I, I'm of the view that, uh, like, like most things that Congress has given FERC, um, they've delegated them a, a relatively broad scope of authority. Think back to the, the vagueness of just and reasonable, which is like the high watermark of legislative delegation to an agency in terms of the truck you can drive through those words. But FERC, in my view, has a lot of the tools that it would need to make the markets in these states more competitive and make FERPA more of a consumer-friendly instrument while probably bringing online more renewables than would occur simply through FERPA's status quo. Um, so I, I view the opportunity to, for reform as one that's relatively ripe. I agree that it would be nice to have more submissions into the record, but you know what? FERC, if it does anything, would simply propose a rulemaking. That proposal can be the moment where they take data and evidence uh, in, in, in their proceeding, in my view. Yeah. I'll just quickly say, there's a great Second Circuit decision out recently that approved New York's ZEC program, which is keeping the upstate nukes alive. And what's really good about it is not necessarily the result or whatever, but the discussion about the, this idea of the cooperative federalism model that, that is sort of implicated by the Federal Power Act and by FERPA. And um, it, what, it, what it discusses, because you know we've got this federal thing coming down and the state's kind of coming up and they meet in the middle, and 
we've always been led to these simplistic co uh, concepts that they were separate. But in reality, they're, they're very much intertwined, right? There's some places where fed the states do things that impact federal wholesale markets. I mean, just by definition, it's silly to pretend otherwise. And there's places where federal rulings impact state markets and state regulation and conditions as well. I think we need to embrace that interaction and do so more. I think of FERC proceedings, and bless their heart, they work hard and they're, they're good people, but I think of FERC proceedings as places where, you know, EEI, uh, Beltway Bandits, high-priced law firms battle it out in a very rarefied and unrealistic environment. And as I see state commissions, because I have a bias that way, as being places much more where the rubber hits the road, we need to find a way for those to have conversations. If there are states that are truly committed to using a, a, a fair, open IRP with rigorous data and analysis, benefit cost analysis, and truly competitive solicitations, if they've got that formula together, figure out a way to introduce that to FERC. Besides necessarily a contested lawsuit, though I, I don't mind that in a nation that's supposed to be you know, following the rule of law, but find a more interactive way to bring those conversations to the feds. Um, I guess it's kind of a populist idea. Maybe that would work in the West. Okay, let's go to our poll result, results. And the results are, uh, the, result, oh, oh, yeah. the results were, <laughs> drum roll, So rhetorical, but yeah, it works. <laughs> Nick, what was the first round? Uh, the first round was 21%. What did you say? 21. Yeah, 2971. Yeah. 2971. Yeah. 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 So if you gain ground, you win. <laughs> if you lose, then I win. <laughs> I believe that's the way it works. I'm certainly not going to make you get to 50. <laughs> Some level of voter. All right, there we go. So we the results are result, result, perfect. It's still a good and necessary policy in the West when it comes to inspectors. Twenty-nine says yes, and oh, that's three. Where's the new one? And a vote.